All right. So experimentally, we know that a reaction rate depends on the concentration of certain reactants as well as concentration of a catalyst if we have one. So here we have a reaction where nitrogen dioxide reacts with fluorine. Experimentally, we find that if we double the concentration of nitrogen dioxide or fluorine, the reaction rate doubles. And so what we can end up creating is the rate law. And what the rate law is, it's an equation that's going to relate the rate of a reaction to the concentration of reactants or catalyst raised to various powers. And those powers are going to end up being what we call the reaction orders. So here we have our reaction again. And the rate law is K, or rate equals K, concentration of nitrogen dioxide times concentration of fluorine. And what that K is, is what we call the rate constant. It's a fixed value at any given temperature. And that definitely varies with temperature. So typically in our problems, they tend to tell us at a certain temperature. And the units of our rate constant depends on the form of the rate law. We're going to see some different rate laws. And depending on what that form is, depends on the units. Well, here we can see what the units would be. Since I, if I rearrange the equation, K equals the rate divided by the two concentrations. And my rate, as we've talked about, is moles per liter seconds. And then those concentrations, moles per liter squared. And if you do the proper math and canceling, you end up that this rate constant has a unit of liters per mole seconds. And the AP exam tends to like to see if you can calculate rate constant equation or units every once in a while. So just in case we ever encounter that. Now, looking at our rate law again, the exponents are typically integers. They are, again, determined experimentally. You don't just take them from balanced equations. A lot of times, the coefficients in the balanced equation matches our rate law, but that's just a coincidence. These exponents are determined experimentally. And then from our rate law, when we know the rate constant, we can calculate the rate of a reaction for any reactant concentrations, and vice versa. All right, so a reaction can be classified by its order. And what this reaction order, it's the exponent of a species that's in the rate law. And again, this is determined experimentally. The overall order of a reaction is going to be the sum of those orders for each of the reactants in the rate law. So let's look at a couple examples. First off, we see the isomerization of cyclopropane. If I heat up cyclopropane, I break the cyclic part and form a different type of propane. But what we end up seeing experimentally is that the rate equals K times the concentration of the cyclopropane. It's the only reactant, so that makes sense. What we say is this reaction is first order with respect to the cyclopropane. And overall, it's a first order reaction. Again, anything, if there's no number there, of course, it's to the first power. Let's look at another example. Here we see the reaction of nitrogen monoxide and hydrogen. And again, experimentally, the rate is found to be K times the concentration of nitrogen monoxide squared times the concentration of hydrogen. So we say that this reaction is second order with respect to nitrogen monoxide, first order with respect to hydrogen, and overall third order, 2 plus 1 is 3. And here we see an example. We have acetone reacting with iodine, and it's in acidic solution, so we have a catalyst here. Now I did have a typo on your notes packet. The product should say CH3COCH2I. But again, experimentally, we find that the rate is K times the concentration of acetone times the concentration of the hydrogen ion, or catalyst. So this reaction is first order with respect to acetone, first order with respect to our catalyst, the hydrogen ion, and zero order with respect to iodine. Iodine is in the equation. Okay, but this is an example of one of our reactions where 
it's not necessarily important to have a certain amount of iodine. We just need to have a little bit present. Overall, this reaction is second order. One plus one is two. And again, as I said, if we have something to the zero order, that is, of course, in math, a one. So as long as some iodine is present, the overall reaction rate is not affected. Just as a note, our orders are typically one or two. And then it can be zero, can be three, especially the overall order can be three. And they can also be negative or fractional, but very, very rare, and I doubt that we'll see any of those on our exam or AP exam. So if you're doing a calculation or something, you get an order of five, probably did something wrong. All right, so let's determine our rate law. Again, this is done experimentally, so you have to be given experimental data. And what we're doing is we're finding the order with respect to each reactant and any catalyst that might be present. First way, a common way that it, this is done is called the initial rate method, where you run a different, couple different experiments where you vary the starting reactant concentrations, and then you compare the rates. Now this little table, table 13.1, is probably going to be helpful to know. It's a huge shortcut, so if you kind of remember that, and I'll show you how to use it here in a second, that could be quite helpful. But I'm going to look at example 13.4. This is found on page 534 and 535 of your book. But you see it here that we're, the iodine ion is oxidized in acidic solution to triiodide ion, and this is done with hydrogen peroxide. So a series of four experiments were run, and there's our data. So our rate is going to be K times concentration of hydrogen peroxide to some power, the concentration of iodide ion to some power, and the concentration of the hydrogen ion to some power. Those are our three reactants as seen in the sample question right up there. And so we need to find X, Y, and Z. So calculating, I can compare two of the experiments and I can do this with each of the different reactants. So you can see experiment one and experiment two. When I look at those two experiments, the hydrogen peroxide concentration was changed, the iodine and hydrogen ion were kept the same. So I can use those two experiments to figure out X. So when I compare the rates and the concentrations, I can figure out X. Rate, one, rate 2 over rate 1 equals the concentration of hydrogen peroxide from 2 over the concentration of hydrogen peroxide from 1 raised to the x power. So when I plug in my data and do my calculations, plug and chug, I find that 2 equals 2 to the x, so of course x equals 1. And I can do that to find y and z. Because if I look at my experiments, you know, if I compare experiment 2 and 3, I can find Y. And if I compare experiments 3 and 4, I could find Z. Or I could use that little shortcut that I was talking about. So typically when we do these, we always try and double the concentrations. So again, if I look at my experimental data, so from experiment 1 to experiment 2, I doubled the concentration of hydrogen peroxide. The rate also doubled. So if the rate doubles, then the exponent is 1. That's how I use that little um, shortcut table. Okay. Looking at my Y, okay, for iodine, when I doubled the concentration of the iodide ion, the rate stayed the same. So the rate was multiplied by 1, so my exponent is 0. Strike that, rewind, my bad. We can't look at that data for our concentration of iodide. 
I have to compare experiment 1 to experiment 3 in order to find my concentration of iodide. Why? Because I need the hydrogen peroxide and the hydrogen ion to stay constant. Okay, so I must compare experiment 1 and experiment 3. So back on the previous page, again here, I should say that I have to compare experiment 1 to experiment 3 in order to find Y. And then to find Z, I would have to compare Sorry, I would have to compare experiment 1 to experiment 4. So my bad. Again, we're looking at looking comparing the different reactions, the different experiments where we double the one set of data and keep the others constant. Sorry, I didn't mean to be confusing there. But again, when I'm looking to find x, I compare, I see that the hydrogen peroxide doubled, the rate doubled and so that is why my exponent is 1. So for the iodide, again, I double the concentration of the iodide ion. The rate, again, also doubles. So that exponent is also 1. And then finally, for the hydrogen ion, when I double the hydrogen ion concentration, the rates whoops <laughs> sorry you can see it there though but the rates stay the same and since the rate is multiplied by one that means the exponent is zero so this again this little table is the shortcut version of what we did back here when we actually went through and did all the math and that you can do the math but you can also just look at when I double the reaction, if the rate is doubled, it's a power of 1. If I double the reaction and the rate is quadrupled, it's a power of 2. If I double the reaction and the rate doesn't change, if I double the concentration and the rate doesn't change, then it's a power of 0. And so because we found 1, 1, 0, this ends up being my rate law for this example. And you can look through the book solution as well if you want to double check that. The last little thing here, and I'll let you go and enjoy the rest of your snow days, is we can find the rate constant from the data that's given to us now that we know our rate law. So our rate law is K times the concentration of hydrogen peroxide times the concentration of iodide. I can rearrange that and see that the rate law constant will be the rate divided by those concentrations. So all I do is plug and chug from one of the sets of data. So I'll just pick experiment 2 here. And so from experiment 2, I plug in my data. Rate is on top, 2.3 times 10 to the negative 6. And on the bottom are the concentrations, 0 0.02 times 0 0.01. And when I plug and chug, I get the lovely answer of 1.2 times 10 to the negative second. And again, figure out the units, make sure they match up liters per mole second. All right. So I hope this helps, and I will see you soon.